Good afternoon. Namaste. Welcome, yoglers, to Kirtan rocking it at Googleplex today. I am delighted and honored to welcome to the Googleplex the biggest name in Kirtan in the Western world, Krishna Das. First time at Google. Now, Krishna Das, as you'll soon find out, was the most unlikely person to be the biggest name in Kirtan. Growing up in Long Island, and his life was going to lead him on a different trajectory, which you'll talk about in a minute. And he left for India, at the encouragement of one of his close friends, former Harvard professor Richard Alpert, now known as famously as Ram Das. And Krishnadas met his teacher, Neem Karoli Baba, there and stayed there. And in his own words, he says, in a manner of speaking, he never came back. <laughs> and here we are in the year 2017, when he's put Kirtan firmly on the global map. He's had 16 albums to his credit, a best selling documentary, One Track Heart. And a few years ago, his album, Live Ananda, was nominated for the Grammy Award in the new age category, that too. Should be in the old age category. <laughs> and so here to tell us the story about his journey and what led him to this point in life, bringing this amazing music to all of us, please welcome to the stage once again, Krishna Das at Google. Thanks. So Krishna Das, mm. I have been pondering about a great mystery of life, and I thought you might be the best person to answer that. That's uh, good, good luck. How <laughs> so how does a Jewish boy growing up in Long Island end up becoming the biggest name in Kirtan? How? Bad luck. <laughs> you know, it's not about names or anything. I, I lived in India for a long time. <clears throat> And I thought I was never going to come back to America when I left. After three, two and a half years, my guru looked at me one day and he said, go back. I said, but I'm just learning Hindi. Too bad, go. So I had to come back. He said, you have attachment there. You have to go back. Little did I know what I was facing. So uh, he sent me back. And uh, many years went by. And I, I was struggling a lot with depression. I went through a lot of, uh, all the things I couldn't do before I went to India because I was scared, I did afterwards. Like drugs, rock and roll, everything I, every possible bit of trouble I could get into, I got into. But I managed to survive it mostly. And um, 20 years or so after my guru died, I was in my room in New York and uh, I was very, very depressed, very, very unhappy. And I walked out into the living room and I was actually struck like a lightning bolt. And, and I knew immediately that if I did not start singing with people, and it was with people, that I would never be able to clean out the dark corners of my own heart and the shadows in my life. It's just that the only thing I had that would work for me was the chanting that I had done in India, and was doing a little bit of kind of privately. And that was a big thing. Because first of all, I didn't want to do it, you know. But uh, when you know something, you know something. And you can kind of tell yourself you don't know. But you know, and you know you know. So it took me a while, and uh, I called a couple of yoga studios in New York. This is in 1994. And I said, blah, 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 you know, I was in India, I used to sing, could I come chant at your place? And one place said no. <laughs> they regret that now. They keep saying, can you come sing at our place? Nah. <laughs> no, nah, they've become friends too. But the other place said, yeah, sure, come on Mondays. We have these little gatherings on Mondays where we read from holy books and take questions. And <clears throat> so I went and... Uh, for a couple of months, I'd go every Monday, and I'd sing for about 20 minutes, and then the two owners, Dave, this is How Jeeva How big was your audience? Huh? How many people were there? Eight. <laughs> On a good night, nine, maybe. And uh, 
so the, the two owners of Jiva Mukti, David and Sharon, two months later I came there and they had gone to India. I didn't even know they were leaving, they had gone. So I sang for a couple of hours and they wound up, they stayed gone for about three months. So every Monday that I was in New York, I would be there and I just got used to singing for a long time. But one day I sh they showed up and we all sat together in the front and they said, you start. I said, okay. I started chanting, and about an hour later, I realized, oh, shit, they're here. And I, and I went like, and they looked at each other and said, keep singing. So that was it. Mondays became my night. And uh, it, just, it just started to, people just started to come. There was no advertising. There was nothing. And the key to it all, and still is, the reason I sing, how I started singing, what every moment that I do sing. I am singing for one reason only, to save my miserable ass, and no other reason. I'm not trying to get anybody off. It's not entertainment. This is my practice. This is what I do to save my life. Every day, every time I sit down, it's about that. And so that intensity is kind of transmitted, I think, to some degree. And besides, I sing what I like. Because when I started singing, you know, nobody was there, so what do you sing? You sing what you like, and that never changed. Um, it seems like other people kind of like it too. So I keep doing it. So a few years ago, you were singing at the Dolores uh, Church in San Francisco, and Larry Brilliant, who mm. at the time was CEO of... Yeah, Google Larry and I were in India together. Yeah, long you, know, time. you were at the ashram together. And I remember you telling Larry, that when the church was full, he said, they're not here to listen to me, they're here to help me sing. <laughs> I need them more than they need me, was yeah. your statement. So what is the singing experience? I noticed that you, your eyes are closed and seem to be in a meditative trance-like state the entire concert. <clears throat> you think so? Mm. Yeah, very deep trance. You fake it well. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's very simple. This, these chants, for, traditionally, for many, many years, have been done as a way of deepening your awareness of what's inside of us, what's underneath our thoughts, what's underneath our emotions, what's always present. It's a kind of awareness. Now most of the time we're totally lost. We're like in dreamland all day long. We're, with, we're thinking, we're imagining, we're fantasizing, we're remembering, but we're never aware of what we're doing. So what we do is we add something to that daily experience. So you pick a chant or a mantra or, or an object of concentration, if it's a meditative practice. And every time you notice that you're not paying attention to what you just agreed to do with yourself, you come back. You're gone, you come back. Like when we chant, we're going to chant in a little while. You will see, if you're paying attention, that you might be able to pay attention for 10 seconds. I mean, if you really, really try it. And then you won't be there until you recognize, oh, I've just been gone for five minutes. And you come back and you... So what we're doing, we're retraining. This is not a learning situation, this is training. They call it, in Tibetan Buddhism, they call it mind training. You're training yourself, you're creating new channels in the brain, actually because you read about neuroplasticity. This is actually true. The brain, the shape of the brain changes with these practices. So we're training ourselves to keep coming back much more quickly as time goes on. And we don't get lost in thought, we don't get lost in our emotions the same way as time goes on. It's not about trying to have any particular kind of blissful practice, you know, blissful feeling or it's that dealing with whatever arises. You know, people think that if they try to meditate and it, they feel like shit afterwards, it didn't work. But if you really feel like shit, it probably worked. <laughs> because you were paying attention. I think and, it works for me every day. Very good. <laughs> that is your true nature, my friend. <laughs> so, one final question. Why, wh how do you explain this very esoteric practice, even considered like a you know, just a folk music style that originated in India suddenly becomes so popular all over the world and Kirtan music festivals 
seen California are full. People ask me all the time, you know, like they say, I want to share my music with the world. How do I do it? And I say, I don't know. I just started singing and everything happened. I had no plan. I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to do anything except save myself. And this is what I had to do to do that. And so far it's worked. I mean, you never know. Tomorrow's another day. But um, as far as the music goes, when I first came back and started singing with people, I sang the melodies that I had learned singing with people in India, Indian melodies. But the longer I was away from India, my true nature kind of took over, which is basically rock and roll. I grew up in the, in the, in the late 50s and 60s, and rock and roll was very important to me, very important. And all those emotional feelings that I had in that kind of, with that kind of music have been kind of transmitted and transformed with this practice. But it comes out sounding like, you know, rock and roll with this little squeeze box here. It doesn't sound the same when I play guitar. I can't chant with a guitar. But when I sit down with this, it's weird. I don't know what it is. So there's no, there was no plan, you know. I don't know. The chord changes have a kind of emotional power. And, uh, they, they touch, push buttons in us. But the real gist of this practice is what we are chanting. You know, if a baby's sick and it has to take medicine, the medicine, you usually hide it in a sweet syrup. So it's easier to take. So in this case, the syrup is the music, but the medicine is what we're chanting, which in India they call the names of God or the divine names. We're not required to believe there's a God. We're not required to believe anything, but we are, but if we do want our lives to be transformed, and if we do want to become good human beings on this planet at this time, in this world right now, some practice has to be done. Otherwise, we're at the mercy of all our negative emotions at any time. We have no vote how we go through the day. If we want to get a vote, some practice has to be done. There's no two ways about it. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish it could just be better, like you push a button, but it isn't. We have to train ourselves to let go of our negative emotions, the negative stories we tell ourselves about ourselves all day long which we believe. You know, we believe everything we think. This is the definition of insanity. Really. And so through these practices, we get a vote as to how we respond to our own thoughts, to our own emotions. And we don't necessarily uh, continue to be ruled by them. But you have to do a practice. Otherwise, you have to find a way of changing the way the direction that that river of thought is going. Anyway, enough of that. Yeah. Thank you for the profound wisdom. Yes, so very profound. <laughs> Googlers will be happy to know that uh, Krishna Das has actually taken his ancient wisdom and brought it to modern times using digital technology. He is a YouTube creator. His channel is Krishna Das Music, and periodically he's at the YouTube uh, studios in New York to record a series called Chai, Chai and Chats. Chats. People come in, they have a little uh, set there at the studios of a diner, a 50s diner with a, juke, a little jukebox thing. So people come and we, we make chai and we sit and talk. It's great. But we didn't come here to hear Krishna Das talk, did we? No. We want to hear him sing. So we will move on to Kirtan. And joining him on stage will be his uh, group, Arjun on the tabla, Genevieve Walker on the violin, and Nina Rao, his manager on Karthals and backup vocals. Please welcome Krishna Das and his band. So once again, the instructions are very simple. You, you, you repeat, I, I sing a line and then you all sing something that sounds something like something I might have sung sometime. <laughs> And then we keep going back and forth. And when you notice that you're not paying attention, don't try too hard, but when you notice you're not paying attention, 
just simply come back to the chanting. And you might sit here for 10 minutes just thinking about other stuff until you notice that that's what you're doing. It's an amazing moment, that moment when you notice that you've been gone for X amount of time. It's a miracle that we ever come back, actually. So. We'll sing uh, a chant, Sri Ram, J Ram, J J Ram. It's in your hymnals still. Sri Ram, J Ram, J J Ram, and Sita Ram, Sita Ram. So I'll sing a line, and then if you like, you can answer. We'll go back and forth for a while. Let's do some ohms together, okay? Because you just got to do that every time. within us that true love lives. Pranam Bhavana Kumar Kalabana Pavaka Gyanagam Jasu Haradayaga Vaziram Sarachapadha Atulita Baladhama Himashala Badehum Tanu Jarana Krasha Yani Nama Braganyam Sakalaguna Nedham Pandarana Madisham Ragupati Priyabhaktam Bhatta jata namam Koshpadi kurta varisham Mashiki kurta rakshasam Ramayana mahamala ratnam Andene latmajam Anjananandaram viram Janaki shoka nashana Pisa makshanta Vande lanka vayankhara Nunga sindho salilam salilam Yashoka vahi janakatma jaya Adatana the Dalanka Amamitam Pranjaliranjanam Manojavam Marutatunya Vegam Jitendriam Udhimatam Burdishtam Patatmajam Vanarayuta Mukyam Shri Ramadutam Sharanam Trapadhe Shri Ramadutam Sharanam Trapadhe Shri Ramadutam Sharanam Prapadhe Shri Ramadutam Sharanam Prapadhe Bhava 
repeat Sri Ram Jai Ram two times and then you answer Sri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram Sri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai
So, Sri Ram there. So, do that for a few days. Let's see what's left. That's how I learned. My guru said, start singing. He didn't say anything about stopping. <laughs> After a few weeks, it's like, hello. We can't think our way out of a prison that's made of thought. Have to find some other way of getting out of jail. The jail of our obsessive thinking and our self-judgment and evaluation, constant, ongoing. It's what humans do. But it's very hard to change the, that pattern. So you have to do, add some other dimension. And that is simply paying attention, coming back. And then you start to recognize things from inside. Nobody has to tell you. Nobody can give this to you. Nobody has to turn you on. You're already, we're already turned on. We just have to uncover what's in there. And that's what these practices do. All of them do the same thing. Slightly different angle, they come at the same thing, but it's all the same. My guru used to go, no matter what, he, he knew everything, right? Past, present, and future. So he'd look at you and he'd go, you know, what am I getting busted for? You know, something I did, something I'm gonna do, or something I'm thinking about doing? <laughs> so we said, Baba, what does it mean when you do that? And he went, What does that mean? He said, many names, many forms, all one. All one. So, that's where he lived, in that oneness. And these names are the names of that place inside of us that <coughs> is that. And as we chant these names or do these practices, what, what that inner essence is covered with starts to dissolve. And that light, or that love, or that truth, or that being that is who we really are, starts to become more available to us. So. stuff works, I can't think of anything to sing. My foolish heart. Okay, so is, I think this is on the sheet. Rade Rade Govinda. Bhaja Govinda. Bhaja means to remember or to sing, to praise. Don't eat that. <laughs> can't eat that. It's not good word. So, I'm going to start with a couple of verses in English. Uh, there was a great hymn written many years ago by a great saint named Shankar Charya. He was walking down the street one day, and he saw an old man on the side of the road teaching the rules of Sanskrit grammar to some students. And being a great saint, he could see that this old guy was going to die very soon and he'd never done any practice, anything to help himself. So out of compassion, he went up to him and he said, oh, my friend, Bhajya Govindam. So Govindam means Krishna, the name of God, and Bhajya means to sing or praise or remember. So he's telling this guy to do something before it's too late. And that night he went home and he wrote a long hymn that he called Bhajya Govindam, and each verse describes the ways that we go through our lives completely asleep, totally lost in whatever we're doing, and we never wake up, and we never do what's really in our own best interest. And we don't get the things we want, we don't get the happiness we want, we don't find the love. So, and then the, the chorus at the end of each verse went, oh my foolish mind, or foolish heart, but you go of do something. So I always wanted to read, it's a beautiful poem, and I always wanted to rewrite it with modern images because they didn't have uh, binge washing in 900, whenever Shankaracharya lived. 
which is how I waste most of my time. But I'm too lazy and it's too long, and so that never happened. So I ran, wrote a couple of new verses in English. And then we'll sing Radhe Radhe Govinda Bhaja Govinda. Yeah. 
So we'll, we'll end with one short chant. Jay Bhagavan. Jay Bhagavan. Jay means victory. Hail or hallelujah. And Bhagavan is the living presence within us. The love that lives within us. It's who we truly are. When we sing Jay Bhagavan, we sing victory to our own hearts. May that love conquer all the darkness. Let's sing this together for a few minutes. Jaya Bhagavan Jaya Bhagavan Jaya Bhagavan
we know anything about a path at all, if we know that there might be a way to live in this world in a good way, with an open heart and without fear, it's only because of the great beings that have gone before us. Out of their love, out of their kindness, they left some footprints for us to follow. So, in the same way that they wish for us, we wish that all beings everywhere, all of us, be safe, be happy, that all of us have good health and enough to eat. And may we all live in peace and at ease of heart, at ease of heart, with whatever comes to us in life. Thanks for coming. Thanks for Gopi for inviting me. And as we say in India, take it easy. <laughs> Namaste. All right, one more time, big round of applause to Prashad Asan. That's Janavi Walker on the violin. Arjun on the tabla, Nina Rao, his manager, as was the kapal player and uh, backup physician. Thank you, Krishna Das. Delighted to have you here.